a John, a Julia and a Walt. Florida Heroes, John Gorey and Julia Tuttle. Dr. Sidney Socloff. Dr. Sidney at Earthlink.net. 2021. Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Cole Tove. A decade before the Civil War, there were several attempts by varied individuals to make artificial ice but none were deemed practical or successful. That is until 1849, when the Scientific America Journal, Volume 5, reported in a small article an ice-making machine created by a Dr. John Gorey of Apalachicola, Florida. In discussing its construction, the article states, the materials employed are everywhere very cheap ones of air and water. It must be apparent upon the slightest reflection that ice can be manufactured at a comparatively low cost. The production of ice within the tropics at a less price than it can be imported from nature. On May 6, 1851, the U.S. Patent Office of New Orleans, Louisiana, issued patent number 8080 to John Gorey for his machine designed to convert water into ice artificially by absorbing its heat of liquefaction with expanding air. The U.S. patent rights were protected for 14 years from date of his patent submission, which was August 22, 1850. However, Gorey could not obtain financial backing and died in 1855 without having manufactured a full-scale machine. In 1858 Ferdinand Carré developed his own mechanical ice-making machine very similar to Gorey's, but with significant improvements, such as using liquid ammonia, instead of water, as his active agent. 
His machine successfully made blocks of ice, and he was awarded a French patent for his invention in 1864, and it became the world standard for the next decade. Where was air conditioning used for the first time? You may not know the name John Gorey, but summer in Florida would be unbearable except for the product of his imagination. Every time you gulp a chili fountain drink, raise a toast to the miracle of manufactured ice. Every time you step out of the sweltering heat and into the delicious cool of a supermarket, give thanks for the man who brought air conditioning to Florida's sweltering summers. In this diorama in the John Gorey State Museum in Apalachicola, the doctor and inventor points to the bucket of ice hanging from the ceiling of his infirmary. A duct above the bucket drew cool air down to his yellow fever patients. John Gorey was a tireless inventor and community leader who's had much compassion for victims of yellow fever and malaria. He is memorialized with the marble statue in the U.S. Capitol for being the father of refrigeration and air conditioning. The Gulf town of Apalachicola is a small fishing village that dates back to the early 1800s when it was a center of cotton commerce. John Gorey was a young New York doctor who moved here in 1833 and quickly became a prominent man in the town. He would become the mayor, postmaster, city treasurer, council member, bank director and founder of Trinity Church. The Gulf town of Apalachicola is a small fishing village that dates back to the early 1800s when it was a center of cotton commerce. However, Gorey is best known for his innovative treatment of yellow fever patients. At the time, yellow fever and malaria, malaria or bad air, were thought to be caused by miasma, the hot, humid air from local swamps. This seemed logical enough. Since outbreaks abated during cool winter months, of course mosquitoes, the real cause of these diseases, also disappeared in cold weather. Corey found that by cooling a patient's room with blocks of ice, he could reduce their fever and save lives. The problem was that it took 500 pounds of ice, shipped from the north in sawdust at $1.50 a pound, to cool a room for a day. At a time when the average skilled wage was $15 a week, Gorey's treatment was enormously expensive. In 1842, Gorey devised a series of steam-powered machines that harnessed the cooling effects of evaporation and expanding air in a series of tubes and tanks. First, he compressed ordinary air to 125 psi which heated it to 500 degrees. Then, he added water, which dropped the temperature to 300 degrees by evaporation. When Gauri allowed the air to expand again to normal pressure, the temperature had dropped below freezing. Eventually, his iron contraption, which is about the size of a modern refrigerator, could produce a brick of ice in about two hours. Here, a park ranger demonstrates the hand-cranked mechanical ice maker invented by John Gorey. Gorey received a patent for his ice maker in 1851, but public acceptance of his creation proved more difficult than the act of invention. In those days, it was like saying you have a machine that will levitate you three feet up or something. The press considered Gauri a quack. And the pulpits preached that he was in cahoots with the devil. This is a three-quarter scale replica of Gauri's ice machine on display at the museum. This is the front page of U.S. Patent Number 8080 dated May 6, 1851, for an ice machine. This is the first page of the description of Gorey's U.S. patent for an ice machine. To all whom it may concern, 
be it known that I, John Gorey, of the city of New Orleans, in the parish of Orleans in state of Louisiana, have invented a new and useful machine for the artificial production of ice and for general refrigeratory purposes, of which the following is a full, clear, and exact description, reference being had to the annexed drawings of the same, making part of this specification. Gorey's ice machine would pave the way for modern air conditioning and would eventually transform the face of the nation. How many of us would be living in Florida without it? But he would never live to see how important his invention would become. He made ice and changed the world. The story of Florida's John Gorey. John Gorey, 1803-1855, was a physician, scientist, inventor, and humanitarian in 1833. He moved to Apalachicola a port city on the Gulf Coast, where he was a resident physician at two hospitals. Dr. John Gorey changed the world with his invention, but many people have never heard of him. After taking the Hippocratic Oath, he vowed to do what no other physician of his day had done, cure malaria and yellow fever. Realizing that temperature affected how likely epidemics would occur, Dr. Gorey set off on his journey that would bring medicine and the world into the future. With little money and even less public support, Dr. Gorey became a well-known face in the South, producing artificial ice in the dead of summer. Once big corporations took over operations, Dr. Gorey's new ice machine was making more ice than ever before, and people started to take notice everywhere. Dr. Gorey's legacy didn't end there. He started applying his technology and his medical practice, leading to the increased comfort and overall health of countless diseased victims suffering from the fevers, as tropical diseases were then called. Today, Dr. Gorey's artificial ice has changed lives and made modern convenience possible. Although he's still little noted in the media, his life and legacy live on through various medical journals, memorials, statues, and people who are passionate about his contribution to the world. Frederick Tudor was an American businessman and merchant. Known as Boston's Ice King, he was the founder of the Tudor Ice Company and a pioneer of the international ice trade in the early 19th century. Tudor made a fortune shipping ice cut from New England ponds to ports in the Caribbean, Europe, and as far away as India and Hong Kong. Gorey's trouble getting venture capital was at least partly the refrigerator result of a smear campaign from the ice king Frederick Tudor, whose vast and profitable operation shipped ice from New England to as far away as Calcutta, India. Tudor paid off papers to trash the new technology and spread the rumor that the machines were unsanitary. Tudor had newspapers to launch a smear campaign against Gorey and his insane notion that humans could create ice. The New York Globe called him a crank down in Florida who thinks he can make ice by his machine as good as God Almighty. Rumors were spread that Gorey's machines were rife with bacteria. It worked. Investors were spooked. Gory was ruined. In any case, after a failed attempt to market his machines, Gory died in 1855 at the age of 52. No organic cause of his death was reported, so it is thought that he died of depression. This is the John Gorey State Museum, is located one block off US 319 on 6th Street in Apalachicola in the Florida Panhandle. In 1851, Gorey was granted the first US patent for mechanical refrigeration. In an effort to treat patients, he developed, 
and received a patent in 1851 for mechanical refrigeration, which led to the modern development of air conditioning. This is the John Gorey Monument in Apalachicola, with the inscription, Inventor of the Ice Machine and Refrigeration. The John Gorey Bridge carries US-98 and US-319 over the Apalachicola Bay. The original John Gorey Bridge was built in 1935, replacing a ferry service between the two towns. It included a rotating section to allow passage of ships with high masts. The current bridge was built in 1988. We will next have a short video clip of the invention of refrigeration. Like much of the South, Florida has a subtropical climate. That means mosquitoes. And in the 1840s, mosquitoes mean diseases like malaria are rife. In 1841, an outbreak of yellow fever decimates the population of northern Florida. And in the middle of all this death and misery, there's this guy, Dr. John Gorey, who is about to start working on an idea that is so big it will ultimately transform all of our lives. Gorey's hospital is filled with patients burning up with fever. Gorey thinks that if he can cool the air around his feverish patients, he can both ease their suffering and stop the spread of disease. And so he sets out to build a contraption to do just that. This is how Gorey's design would have worked. He's, he's got a chimney bringing in air from above the hospital that flows down over this giant basin. And he would take these huge blocks of ice and put them in the basin. And the result would be perfectly chilled air flows over the patients in their beds reducing their fevers, potentially saving their lives. But shipwrecks along Hurricane Alley mean delayed ice shipments from New England. So one day, Gorey's supply runs dry. Now, Gorey has the crazy idea to make his own ice. For all of human history, you couldn't even conceive of making artificial cold. But by 1850, the pieces had come together. In the 1600s, scientists used a pump to suck air from a jar and discovered the vacuum, proving that air was made from some mysterious invisible elements. We then found that when air or other gases are squashed together, they heat up. And when they are stretched out, they cool down. The thermometer comes along, followed by a universal scale or two allowing us to measure temperature. And now, amazing machines can be built that convert the heat from gases into a usable energy. John Gorey brings all these ideas together and builds America's first mechanical refrigerator, a machine that makes ice. In the 20 years following Gorey's invention, there are 54 separate refrigeration patents filed. Refrigeration becomes a huge industry, but the machinery of man-made cold is destined to get smaller as the idea of a once ridiculed amateur inventor becomes an essential part of the modern home. Here she comes, the lucky woman who owns a new refrigerator. Between 1945 and 1949, Americans purchased 20 million of these revolutionary machines. Now, ideas about how to fill these new refrigerators will have an even greater impact on our lives. We will next have a short video clip of Dr. John Gorey, the father of air conditioning. Here at the John Gorey Museum State Park, we celebrate Dr. Gorey from the beginnings when he was trying to cure malaria and trying to ease his patient's sufferings, to the invention of the machine which produced artificial ice and would be the precursor to modern air conditioning. 
Adjoining the John Gorey Museum is his grave site and also a monument dedicated to him by the Southern Ice Exchange in 1900. Dr. Gorey was actively involved in his community of Apalachicola. As well as being a resident physician at two hospitals, he served as postmaster, bank president, and was a founding vestryman of the Trinity Episcopal Church. After 1845, he gave up his medical practice to pursue refrigeration projects. On May 6, 1851, Gorey was granted patent number 8080 for a machine to make ice. The availability of ice, no matter the season, helped to transform Florida and the nation as a whole. The original model of this machine and the scientific articles he wrote are archived at the Smithsonian Institution. John Gorey has been recognized in several different ways to honor his legacy. There is the John Gorey Memorial Bridge located in Apalachicola. Two schools were also named after him, a junior high in Jacksonville and the oldest operating elementary school in the state of Florida located in Tampa. The University of Florida School of Medicine also recognizes Dr. Gorey with the John Gorey Award, which is presented to the most outstanding student in the class. Additionally, Dr. Gorey is recognized for his contributions to society by being acknowledged as a notable person in Florida's history and honored with a statue in the National Statuary Hall of Fame located in the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. Modern refrigeration and the availability of artificial ice have changed the way we live. Much of modern refrigeration and ice production is still based upon the principles studied by Dr. Gorey. The Florida Park Service and the John Gorey Museum State Park are honored to be a part of this recognition of Dr. Gorey, his legacy, and his invention that changed the world. Around uh, the latter part of June, I received a telephone call from uh, City Administrator Betty Well uh, informing me that uh, someone had asked the city to nominate uh, Dr. John, John Gorey uh, for induction into the newly established Inventors Hall of Fame. And I could not think of anybody from Florida that would have been more deserving than Dr. Gorey. Uh, he is considered the father of modern refrigeration and air conditioning. Therefore, it be proclaimed that our Mayor Van W. Johnson, Sr., on behalf of our distinguished Board of Commissioners, administrators, staff, and citizens of historic Apalachicola, hereby take this opportunity to give recognition and express our humble appreciation to Dr. John Gore, M.D., and further dedicate the annual 2014 Water Street Festival Ice in his honor to coincide with his induction into the Florida Aventus Hall of Fame, hereby proclaim the 16th day of August, 2014, Mayor Van W. Johnson, Sr., historic city of Apalachicola. We will next have a short video clip of how does a refrigerator work. Refrigeration explained. Before refrigeration, keeping food fresh was a pretty tough job. In those days, people used to salt their food or bury it in the snow to keep it fresh. But now, the refrigerator has changed the way we conduct our daily lives, making it easier to preserve food. Have you ever wondered how a refrigerator keeps your food fresh and provides you with a refreshingly chilled beverage on a hot day? Well, let's find out. Refrigeration is actually quite simple. To understand the principles behind it, just remember that when liquid evaporates, it absorbs heat, and when it condenses, it releases heat. A simple example is that when your hand is wet, it feels cold. This is the process of the water evaporating and cooling your hand. On a very humid, hot day, your frosty beer will have water condensing on the outside of the bottle. This warms your beer. To pull off this frosty feat, a refrigerator uses five major components. An expansion device, evaporator coils, a compressor, condenser coils, and a refrigerant. The refrigerant is a liquid that enters in the expansion device. As it passes through, the sudden drop in pressure makes it expand, cool, and turn into a gas. 
As the refrigerant flows around the evaporator coil, it absorbs and removes heat from the food inside. The compressor squeezes the refrigerant, raising its temperature and pressure. It's now a hot, high-pressured gas. The refrigerant then flows through condenser coils on the back of the fridge, radiating its heat to the atmosphere and cooling back into a liquid as it does so. The refrigerant then re-enters the expansion device and the cycle repeats itself. So basically, heat is constantly picked up from the inside of the refrigerator and taken outside of it. That's all. How do you make cold? This is the inside space and the outside. Microsoft PowerPoint. Please select one and only one shape and try again. Okay. Refrigeration or cooling is a continuous loop in which a refrigerant, gas or liquid, circulates from the space to the outside. The refrigerant absorbs heat from the space and transfer it to the outside. This is a refrigeration loop 1. Compress a gas, the refrigerant. It gets hot. Outdoor. 2. Cool the hot gas. Depending of the gas, it may liquefy when cooled. 3. Let the compressed gas, the refrigerant, or liquefied gas, expand or evaporate. It gets cold. 4. Circulate the air or liquid around the cold gas. 5. Compress the gas again. And the refrigeration cycle continues of compression, cooling, and expansion. Julia Tuttle, the mother of Miami. Julia DeForest Tuttle, 1849-1898, was an American businesswoman, who was the original owner of the land, upon which Miami was built and was largely responsible for convincing Flagler to extend his railroad down to Miami. For these reasons, Julia Tuttle is called the mother of Miami. She is the only woman to found a major American city. Julia Sturdevant was the daughter of Ephraim Sturdevant, a Florida planter and state senator. She was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1849. Julia married Frederick Leonard Tuttle in 1867. They had two children, a daughter, Francis Ameline, born 1868, and a son, Henry Ethelbert, born 1870. After the United States acquired Florida from Spain in 1821, Fort Dallas, the site of present-day Miami, was built in 1836 as a base during the Seminole Wars. Fort Dallas was built on the Miami River near Biscayne Bay. Later the name of the settlement was changed to Miami. Tuttle first came to Fort Dallas in 1876 from Cleveland on a steamship after her father and mother had moved to South Florida. When her father died in 1890 and left her his land in Florida, she sold her home in Cleveland and relocated to Biscayne Bay. A few settlers, among them Julia D. Tuttle, known as the mother of Miami, and William B. Brickle, gradually moved into the area. Tuttle used the money from her parents' estate to purchase the James Egan Grant of 640 acres, where the city of Miami is now located, on the north side of the river including the old Fort Dallas stone buildings and the two-story rock house built by Richard Fitzpatrick slave some 50 years earlier. The Miami River of Florida, not to be confused with the much larger and longer river of the same name in Ohio, drains out of the Everglades and runs through the city of Miami, including downtown. The Miami River is five and one-half miles long and flows from the terminus of the Miami Canal at the Miami International Airport to the port of Miami at Biscayne Bay. 
The Miami River was originally a natural river inhabited at its mouth by the Tequesta Indians. But it was dredged and is now polluted throughout its route through Miami-Dade County. The mouth of the river is home to the Port of Miami and many other businesses whose pressure to maintain it has helped to improve the river's condition. Julia converted part of the buildings of Fort Dallas into their home in 1891. Tuttle brought her family to live there. She repaired and transformed the home into one of the show places in the area with a sweeping view of the river and Biscayne Bay. This is a sign at the Tuttle home site. It reads, Mrs. Julia D. Tuttle of Cleveland, Ohio acquired 644 acres on the north bank of the Miami River in 1891. She resided in the remodeled officers' quarters of Old Fort Dallas 100 yards southeast of this spot until her death September 14, 1898. With rare foresight and energy, she persuaded Henry M. Flagler to extend his railroad to Miami in 1896. As inducement, Mrs. Tuttle gave him 100 acres for a railroad terminal and hotel and 263 acres in alternate city blocks, more than half her land, thus earning her fame as the mother of Miami. The Miami Hotel was the city's first hotel, according to the State Archives of Florida. It was built by Julia Tuttle as a bunkhouse. She had the building jacked up, set on a brick foundation and enlarged. It burned down in 1899. Dallas Park, home of Mrs. Julia Tuttle, originally stood between Southeast 2nd and Miami Avenue facing the Miami River. Flagler originally intended for West Palm Beach to be the terminus of his railroad system. But, a freeze during the winter of 1894-95 killed most of Florida's citrus crop. This freeze extended south down the Florida Peninsula reaching almost to present today, West Palm Beach. Sixty miles south, the town known today as Miami was reportedly unharmed by the freeze. Julia Tuttle, an early resident of what was to become Miami, reportedly sent Flagler a fresh orange blossom to prove that the freeze had not reached Miami. To further convince Flagler to continue the railroad to Miami, he was offered land in exchange for laying rail tracks. This offer was from private landowners, including Julia Tuttle, who ran a trading post on the Miami River. This convinced Flagler to extend the railroad down to Miami. Under an agreement between the two, Tuttle supplied Flagler with the land for a hotel and a railroad station for free, and they split the remainder of her 640 acres north of the Miami River in alternating sections. On April 22, 1896, train service of the Florida East Coast Railway came to the area. Flagler's Railroad, renamed the Florida East Coast Railway in 1895, reached Biscayne Bay by 1896. This led to the development of Miami, which was only an unincorporated area at the time. Flagler extended his Florida East Coast Railway to Miami after Tuttle and Brickell each gave him half of their land holdings for the project. Flagler then dredged the harbor, built the Royal Palm Hotel, and promoted tourism. Miami was incorporated that same year of 1896. Flagler dredged a channel, built streets, instituted the first water and power systems, and financed the city's first newspaper, the Metropolis. This is the initial issue of the first newspaper in Miami, the Metropolis which later became the Miami News on May 15, 1896. The Miami Metropolis with an article about Julia Tuttle. 
the Miami Metropolis with an article about Julia Tuttle. The initial issue of the first newspaper in Miami, the Metropolis, which later became the Miami News on May 15, 1896, paid tribute to Mrs. Tuttle by saying, a few years hence it will be realized that she builded sick better than the critics knew, and the future residents of Miami will accord her full credit for her plans of today, and bless the good fate that put the founding of Miami in such competent hands. When the city was incorporated in 1896, its citizens wanted to honor the man responsible for its growth by naming it Flagler. Flagler declined the honor, persuading them to use an old Indian name, Miami. This is Henry Morrison Flagler, builder of Florida and father of Miami. Julia died in 1898 at age 49. Her funeral took place at her Fort Dallas home, and she was buried in a place of honor at the city of Miami Cemetery. This is the Julia Tuttle Causeway, Interstate 195, connecting I-95 in Miami with Miami Beach. Miami 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 is the largest city in the South Florida metropolitan area, which comprises Miami-Dade County, Broward County, and Palm Beach County. It is the largest metropolitan area in the southeastern United States and the sixth largest metropolitan area in the entire United States. Miami and the surrounding metropolitan area are situated on northern Biscayne Bay, between the Everglades and the Atlantic Ocean. Bridges over Biscayne Bay connect Miami to the islands of Miami Beach and Key Biscayne. To this day Miami has preserved its unique architecture and colorful facades. This is a large city, but it tends not to resemble Chicago or New York in that there is hardly any gray or just bare stone. Colors are vibrant. Shapes and themes are various. Miami has been the subject of several movies and TV series, such as Moon Over Miami in 1941. Miami Vice, 1984-1990, and CSI, Miami from 2002-2012. The Golden Girls from 1985 to 1992. Miami was officially incorporated as a city in 1896, with a voting population of just over 300 in 1940. 170,000 people lived in the city. Now the city proper has 454,000 people. In the larger metropolitan area population is 5.5 million. Miami's explosive population growth in recent years has been driven by migration from other parts of the U.S., especially the northeastern and midwestern states, as well as by immigration from Cuba, the Caribbean, and other parts of Latin America. Greater Miami is regarded as a cultural melting pot, heavily influenced both by its large population of ethnic Latin Americans. The region's importance as an international financial and cultural center has elevated Miami to the status of a world city.
because of Miami's cultural and linguistic ties to North, South, and Central America. And the Caribbean it is sometimes called the Gateway of the Americas. Florida's large Spanish-speaking population and strong economic ties to Latin America also make Miami and the surrounding region an important center of the Hispanic world. Harold Schwartz, 1910-2003, was an American businessman and real estate developer who along with his son, H. Gary Morse, founded the active adult retirement community of the villages in Florida. Harold Samuel Schwartz was born March 13, 1910, in Chicago, Illinois, the son of Louis and Catherine Schwartz. In the 1930s, Schwartz worked as a traveling salesman, selling products for his father's tailoring company until it was forced to close due to the Great Depression. This is Mary Louise Brown Schwartz, first wife of Harold Schwartz. Mary Louise Brown Schwartz was the mother with Harold of Harold Gary Schwartz and Mary Louise Schwartz. In 1944, Mary Louise started a tourist attraction called Brownwood Farms in northern Michigan. This is the original Brownwood in Central Lake, Michigan. In 1947, Schwartz began purchasing radio stations, including several border buster stations in Mexico. Many of these stations, located just across the border with the United States, operated without proper licenses. Schwartz is credited with the discovery of famed disc jockey and radio personality Wolfman Jack, employing him at his Tijuana, Mexico, radio station in the late 1960s. In the 1950s and 60s, Schwartz operated a thriving mail-order real estate business selling plots of land in New Mexico and Florida to customers around the country until federal law banned the practice in 1968. In the early 1970s, Schwartz turned his focus from mail-order land sales to land development in 1982. Schwartz, along with business partner Al Terson, founded Orange Blossom Gardens a mobile home park in Central Florida located off of U.S. Highways 27 and 441. Using land left over from his mail-order land sales business, Schwartz began selling homes to retirees. Initially, sales were slow, with only about 400 homes being built in the original development. In 1934, Schwartz married Mary Louise Lee. Together, the two shared a son, Harold, and a daughter, Mary. The two later divorced in 1946. Schwartz married Bernice Newman. Together they shared a son, Richard. In 1983, Schwartz, unsatisfied with the progress, bought out Terson's interest in the business and brought in his son, advertising executive, H. Harold, Gary Morse as a business partner to manage Orange Blossom Gardens and its 386 mobile homes. Together, they started making improvements, like adding swimming pools and golf courses, that would propel the successful formation of the villages. Schwartz and Morse increased sales at Orange Blossom Gardens exponentially and created interest in the growing community. In 1992, the name of the development was changed from Orange Blossom Gardens to the Villages. Schwartz died on December 22, 2003, at the age of 93. His ashes were interred in the base of a statue depicting him at Spanish Springs Town Square and the villages. Schwartz wanted many things for his residence, but at the top of his list was a hospital located in the community.
So in 1997, as Morse was embroiled in a political battle to secure the coveted medical facility, the 87-year-old Schwartz took the bold step of putting his image on a billboard, pointing in the ground, with the words, I'll live to see the village's regional hospital right here. By 1989, the villages was off to a good start. Orange Blossom Gardens had become one of 16 villages in the community. And it became time to construct the first town square, to be called Spanish Springs. This is an advertisement for a manufactured home in Orange Blossom Gardens. This is an advertisement the amenities in Orange Blossom Gardens. Schwartz finally retired in 1994 and enjoyed his final years relaxing in the community he helped bring to life. He turned over operation of the community to Morse and his children, Mark Morse, Tracy Matthews and Jennifer Parr, and enjoyed time with the many good friends he had made in the villages. Harold Gary Morse was a billionaire and the developer of the villages. Morse was born in Chicago, the son of Mary Louise and Harold Schwartz. After the couple divorced, Mary Louise married Clifford Morse. Gary would later take his stepfather's surname and live in Michigan. Because World War II was in full swing, his mother was fearful the Schwartz name of her children might be an anti-Semitic target in case the Nazis invaded the United States. Clifford Morse adopted the children and their names were legally changed to his Morse. H. Gary Morse was first married to Sharon Morse, who died in 1999. Morse and his second wife, Renee, lived together in the villages. Morse had three children, Mark Morse, Jennifer Parr and Tracy Morse, each of whom own and work for the holding company of the Villages Limited. Morse is known for having had a private life, making little contact with other residents and not giving interviews to the media. Dad never saw the limelight. He was content to stay in the background and enjoy seeing villagers revel in this amazing lifestyle of their adopted hometown. While he was a friend and advisor to captains of industry, presidents and heads of state, he never lost focus on this community and making it the greatest retirement development in the world. This is the Morse family, Sharon, Gary and children, Tracy, Mark, and Jennifer. Tracy, H. Gary Morse, Mark, and Jennifer. What Florida county is named after the first and last U.S. Senator? It's Lovey County. David Levy was the first U.S. Senator from Florida after Florida was admitted to the Union in 1845. He served from 1845 to 1851 and then from 1855 to when he resigned from the Senate in 1861, when Florida seceded from the Union. He was born David Lovey in Charlotte to Mali, on the island of St. Thomas. His father was Moses Elias Lovey, a Sephardi Jewish businessman from Morocco who made a fortune in lumber in the British colony. His mother, Hannah Abendanon, was also Sephardi. Her ancestors had gone from Spain in the 15th century expulsion to the Protestant Netherlands and England. Some later migrated to the Caribbean as English colonists during the British occupation of the Danish West Indies, now the United States Virgin Islands. Moses Levy was a first cousin and business partner of Philip Benjamin, the father of Judah P. Benjamin the future Secretary of State of the Confederate States of America. What is the Cross Florida Railroad? 
way before Flagler and Plant there was Levy and his Cross Florida Railroad. Levy was called the father of Florida Railroads and chartered the Florida Railroad in 1853. Construction began in 1855 and was completed across the state from Fernandina on the Atlantic coast to Cedar Key on the Gulf in 1861, just weeks before the beginning of the Civil War. The Cross Florida Railroad from Fernandina on the Atlantic was started August 1856, and reached Cedar Key on the Gulf, in March 1861. The Cross Florida Railroad ran through Gainesville, and was 155 miles long from coast to coast. Trade between ports like New Orleans and those in the northeast U.S. no longer had to go around the Florida Keys. The Yearly Sugar Mill Ruins Historic State Park is a Florida state park located in Hamasasa, off U.S. 19. It contains the ruins of a forced labor farm owned by David Levy Yuli. This shows the location of the Yuli Sugar Mill Ruins Historic State Park, a Florida state park located in Hamasasa, off U.S. 19. After Florida seceded from the Union, Yuli served in the Confederate Congress. He is credited with having developed a network of railroads that tremendously boosted the state's economy. Recommended video Dr. John Gorey, the father of air conditioning. 3 minutes. 48 seconds. Recommended video, invention of refrigeration. 3 minutes. 29 seconds. Recommended video, how does a refrigerator work? Refrigeration explained. 2 minutes. 18 seconds. YouHowTo.be web link 218. Recommended video, simple refrigeration cycle, animated, refrigeration, 4 minutes, 13 seconds. Recommended video, how does a refrigerator work? Refrigeration explained, 2 minutes, 18 seconds. YouHowTo.be web link 218. Recommended video, Frederick Tudor, in five parts. Approximately five minutes total. Recommended video, The Villages, historical timeline, five minutes, 19 seconds. Table of contents, 